Welcome back everyone, Houston Math Prep here to talk about how linear independence may affect your solution when using the method of undetermined coefficients to solve second order equations. So if we start with some non-homogeneous equation and we have constant coefficients here a, b, and c, g of x some function on the right hand side. Remember that our solution to this equation will be y equals some complementary function plus some particular function. And for the method of undetermined coefficients, this y sub p is based on the form of whatever you see in your g of x on the right hand side. Remember for a second order equation, our complementary function is going to be made up of two pieces, some linear combination of two functions y1 and y2, and we want to make a note that y1, y2, and y sub p all need to be linearly independent. Now just remember that if the form that we would usually choose for y sub p, our particular function, based on what we see from g of x on the right hand side, if that is some constant multiple or linear combination of what we have from y1 and y2 in our complementary function, then remember that the way we will get linear independence for y sub p is to multiply what we would normally choose for y sub p by x. Let's take a look here at an example. We have y double prime plus 3y prime plus 2y equal to e to the negative 2x. The first thing that we would do is solve the associated homogeneous equation, which would be y double prime plus 3y prime plus 2y is equal to 0. So we solve this homogeneous equation here. We use the characteristic polynomial. This gives us m squared plus 3m plus 2 is equal to 0. We just solve this using algebra. This is factorable, so we could say m plus 1 times m plus 2 is equal to 0. And if we set each of these factors equal to 0, then we will get answers of negative 1 and negative 2 for m. And remember, that will tell us that our complementary function for this is going to equal some constant times e to the negative 1x plus c2 times e to the negative 2x. Now we would then go ahead and look at our right hand side and see e to the negative 2x and that's our g of x. And so from our undetermined coefficients introduction video we would assume that the particular solution is some multiple itself of e to the negative 2x. The problem with that our y sub p, our a e to the negative 2x, that's just a constant multiple of e to the negative 2x, and so is c2 e to the negative 2x. So these are constant multiples of each other. They are not linearly independent. And so this is not actually the y sub p we're looking for. What we'll need to do is multiply this by x, so we won't use this, but we will use y sub p is equal to a x e to the negative 2x. Notice this y sub p is not some constant multiple of anything in y sub c, and also when we're taking first and second derivatives of this, the product rule that we're going to need to do that is still going to give us some copies of e to the negative 2x. So if we use y sub p is equal to this, let's go ahead and do our first derivative. So this is a product rule. We have ax times e to the negative 2x. If we take the first half of the product rule, that would be a e to the negative 2x. And then if we take the second half of the product rule, we would keep the ax, a negative 2 would come out, so we'd actually get negative 2ax e to the negative 2x. Let's get our second derivative now, so yp double prime. Here this is not a product rule, if we take the derivative of this we just get negative 2a e to the negative 2x. Here we have a product rule, I'll go ahead and write down my negative 2 and then just do this original thing that I had again. So we'll get a e to the negative 2x minus 2a x e to the negative 2x. And I'll go ahead and rewrite what that is then. So here I get negative 2a e to the negative 2x minus another 2a e to the negative 2x. So that's actually negative 4a e to the negative 2x, and then distributing the negative 2 there we get plus 4ax e to the negative 2x. Okay, let's go ahead and take these and we'll plug them into our original equation there. So our y double prime in the front is just this negative 4a e to the negative 2x plus 4ax e to the negative 2x. plus 3y prime, so plus 3y prime, which is a e to the negative 2x minus 2ax e to the negative 2x 
plus 2y, which is the original, ax e to the negative 2x, that's our yp, equal to our right-hand side e to the negative 2x. We'll go ahead and distribute everything, so we'll get negative 4a e to the negative 2x plus 4ax e to the negative 2x, distribute the 3 plus 3a e to the negative 2x minus 6ax e to the negative 2x plus 2ax e to the negative 2x. Just be careful, it's easy to miss an x or an a. Now I just combine all of my like terms. So the terms that don't have an x, I have one there and one there. So negative 4a plus 3a would make negative a e to the negative 2x. And if I combine all the terms that have an x in them, I have 4ax e to the negative 2x minus 6a x e to the negative 2x plus 2a x e to the negative 2x. Think about 4 minus 6 would be negative 2 plus 2 would give us 0 of these, right? So this actually all becomes 0. So we get negative a e to the negative 2x is equal to e to the negative 2x. And now we just compare our coefficients, right? These are like terms. How many do I have over here? Well, I have negative a, so negative a is equal to, how many do I have over here? This is like having a one here. So negative a is equal to one. Multiply or divide by negative one is going to give you that a is negative one, right? So remember that since our y sub p was a x e to the negative two x, then in this case, that actually makes our y sub p negative x e to the negative two x. So if we then combine our complementary function and our particular function, then our solution for this is going to be c1 e to the negative x plus c2 e to the negative 2x, that's our y sub c, plus our yp, so that will actually give us minus x e to the negative 2x. And this is not a constant multiple of that c2 term anymore. Let's take a look at another. We have y double prime plus 4y equal to sine 2x. So if we solve the associated homogeneous equation, y double prime plus 4y is equal to 0. And our characteristic polynomial for that is going to be m squared plus 4 is equal to 0. If I subtract 4, I'll get m squared is equal to negative 4. And square rooting both sides will give us that m is equal to positive or negative 2i. We get complex solutions for the characteristic polynomial here. This tells us that alpha is 0 and it tells us that beta is 2. So our complementary function that's going to be part of our solution is going to be c1 cosine of 2x plus c2 sine of 2x. Now you can see here based on our right hand side our g of x, so g of x in this case is sine 2x and remember what we would choose for our yp normally based on this g of x, we would choose some multiple of cosine 2x plus some multiple of sine 2x. But you can see here that these are actually constant multiples of what we already have in our c1 and c2 terms here in our complementary function. So we'll need to go ahead and multiply everything by x here. So we won't actually use this. We will actually use y sub p is ax cosine 2x plus bx sine of 2x. So we won't be using this for our yp. We'll need to go ahead and work out our y prime and y double prime terms though. I'm going to give myself some room here because these are going to now be product rules, right? So if I take the product rule for this first part, I will get a cosine 2x minus 2ax sine 2x. That's the first part there, plus the derivative of this will get b sine 2x, that's a product rule also, plus 2bx cosine 2x. All right, let's go ahead and get our second derivative, so y sub p double prime. The derivative of this first term is not a product rule, so we'll get negative 2 a sine of 2x 
Before I do the product rule, this next one, I'm going to go ahead and bump out the negative 2 multiple. So derivative of ax times sine 2x, we would get a sine 2x plus 2ax plus 2 ax cosine 2x. So that's our product rule from here. The derivative of b sine 2x is not a product rule. And here we'll just get 2b cosine 2x. I'll go ahead and bump out my multiple 2 here. And then the derivative of bx cosine 2x is going to be a product rule. So we'll get b cosine 2x minus 2bx sine 2x. We do have some like terms in here. Let's go ahead and combine those. We have negative 2a sine 2x, another negative 2a sine 2x. That's going to give us negative 4a sine 2x. Here's my only ax cosine 2x term. So if I distribute the negative 2 there, we'll get negative 4ax cosine 2x. Notice next we have 2b cosine 2x. When we distribute the 2, we have another 2b cosine 2x. So that's actually 4b cosine 2x. And then distributing the 2 here, we'll actually get minus 4bx sine 2x. Okay, so that's our y double prime, our y prime, our y. We'll go ahead and take that and plug it into our original, remember which was y double prime plus 4y is equal to sine 2x. So let's go ahead and write all of this down in terms of that. So y double prime is going to be all of the stuff we just wrote down, negative 4a sine 2x minus 4ax cosine 2x. Try to condense this space-wise a little bit. Plus 4b cosine 2x minus 4bx sine 2x. So that's our y double prime plus 4y. So 4 times our y sub p, which is ax cosine 2x plus bx sine 2x. That's our left side equal to sine 2x. And now let's look at anything we can reduce. So notice uh, we have uh, 4ax cosine 2x here. That's going to reduce with this minus 4ax cosine 2x. So really that's going to go away. If I distribute the 4 to there, I get positive 4bx sine 2x. That's going to reduce the negative 4bx sine 2x there. So really we don't have to worry about anything over here. We end up with negative 4a sine 2x plus 4b cosine 2x is equal to sine 2x, our right-hand side. Now remember, the coefficients need to be the same on each side. If it helps you to think of a 1 here, and it helps you to also write 0 cosine 2x, since that term is not there, you can go ahead and do that. But that tells you that negative 4a is equal to 1, because those are both the sine 2x coefficients. So we get negative 4a is equal to 1. And then our cosine 2x coefficient should be the same as well, right? So 4b should be the same as 0. So 4b equals 0. If we solve these, we'll get that a is equal to negative 1 fourth. And of course, we'll get that b is 0 here. And so now just put these back into your y sub p, right? Remember, y sub p was going to be ax cosine 2x plus bx sine 2x. So if we plug that in, again, b is going to be 0, so we won't have any second term there. We'll just get our y sub p is going to be negative 1 fourth x cosine 2x. And now let's just write our general solution. So remember, we're going to have yc plus yp. So we'll get y is equal to, if you remember, we had c1 cosine 2x plus c2 sine 2x. And then plus our yp is going to be minus 1 fourth x cosine of 2x. In our final example here, we're actually going to show you how sometimes multiplying by x isn't enough. So here we've got y double prime plus 2y prime plus y is equal to 4e to the negative x. 
So if I go ahead and solve the associated homogeneous equation, which is y double prime plus 2y prime plus y equal to 0, my characteristic polynomial would be m squared plus 2m plus 1. And solving that equal to 0, this actually factors into the same factor twice. So we get m plus 1 quantity squared is equal to 0. And so what we really get then, if we set each of those, really only one factor equal to 0, we get m equals negative 1, and it has multiplicity 2. This is a repeated real root. So in our y sub c, we should know that we're already multiplying one of these by x, right? We get c1 e to the negative x. Our second part of our yc would be c2x e to the negative x when we have a repeated real root. And now think about if we look at our g of x over here on the right hand side, we have some multiple of e to the negative x. What we would normally choose is that y sub p would be just a e to the negative x. But that is a constant multiple of our c1 term over here. So we can't choose that. We need to multiply by x. But if we multiply by x, we would then have a x e to the negative x. But that is now a constant multiple of our c2 term. So neither of these will work. What we need to do is then multiply by x one more time and actually choose our y sub p to be ax squared e to the negative x. So neither of these are going to work. We actually had to multiply by x twice for linear independence with our y sub c. So let's go ahead and figure out our derivatives. So if yp is ax squared e to the negative x, so we'll have a product rule for the derivative. So yp prime is going to equal 2ax e to the negative x minus ax squared e to the negative x. Now each of these again are going to be a product rule. So for our second derivative, then we'll go ahead and do a product rule for each piece. So y double prime here, we would get 2a e to the negative x minus 2ax e to the negative x. That's our product rule for the first part there. Minus, and then doing our product rule here, we get 2ax e to the negative x minus ax squared e to the negative x. All right, let's go ahead and clean this up a bit. We have some like terms here, so that'll be 2a e to the negative x minus 2ax e to the negative x minus another 2ax e to the negative x is minus 4a x e to the negative x, and then distributing that there we get plus ax squared e to the negative x. Just be careful when you're doing these you don't accidentally combine something that looks like like terms, right? So now we go ahead and plug into our original. I'm going to go ahead and scroll up a little so we can see that. So y double prime, which is what we just got, so 2a e to the negative x minus 4ax e to the negative x plus ax squared e to the negative x. Next is plus 2y prime, so plus 2 times our y p prime, which is 2ax e to the negative x minus ax squared e to the negative x plus y, which is our original y p, so plus ax squared e to the negative x is equal to the right hand side which is 4e to the negative x. Alright, so let's go ahead and distribute and then we'll see what happens. So 2a e to the negative x minus 4ax e to the negative x plus ax squared e to the negative x. Distributing 2 we'll get plus 4ax e to the negative x minus 2a x squared e to the negative x plus a x squared e to the negative x equal to 4e to the negative x. Now notice we have some things that reduce here. We have a negative 4ax e to the negative x and a positive term that is the same, so those will zero out. Here you can see we have ax squared e to the negative x plus another one makes two of those, which is going to zero out with the negative 2ax 
squared e to the negative x, so all of those become zero as well. And we just end up with two terms left in our equation, right? We have 2a e to the negative x is equal to 4 e to the negative x. So comparing coefficients, that tells us that 2a is equal to 4. And we'll get if 2a is equal to 4, that certainly divide both sides by 2 gives us that a is 2. Right, so if a is 2 and our yp was a x squared e to the negative x, then our y sub p is actually 2x squared e to the negative x. So if we go ahead and combine that with our yc, remember y is equal to y sub c plus y sub p. So in this case, we're going to get y is equal to c1 e to the negative x plus c2 x e to the negative x. So that's our yc plus our yp, which is 2x squared e to the negative x. All right, everyone, hopefully this helps you getting a particular function y sub p in your method of undetermined coefficients that is linearly independent from your y sub c terms. Thanks for watching. We'll see you in the next video.